Hi everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master, the surgical training for dentists. Welcome to another quick lecture, and this time I'm going to talk about grafting an infected site. And a common question that I'm being asked is, can you, should you, graft an infected site? It's a very good question. And this presentation is a follow-up on a video that I posted a few weeks ago where I showed you how I handled the missing buccal plate and I described the extraction process and the handling of the membrane and the bone graft. Now, this particular video, by now, several thousands of doctors watched it worldwide online and there was a very elaborate discussion and I got a lot of good comments and feedback and also some uh, criticism, which is great. And I learned a lot from the discussion, so thank you. So what I described is an extraction and a bone graft of a lower molar uh, where I was planning to place an implant in a delayed way. Now one of the questions that I was asked is why didn't I place an immediate implant? Why didn't I place a provisional, even loaded it? So that, that was one suggestion. On the other end, there was a question, you know, why did I place a bone graft? You know, am I concerned with infection of the bone graft? There were some questions and concerns that this bone graft may fail. And there were a lot of other questions relating to the bone graft type and the membrane and the use of biologics or the growth factors and how we sequence this treatment. So what was interesting to me is that there were opinions of the you know, in the two ends of the spectrum. And really what came to my mind is, you know, why, why are the differences, there's significant differences between doctors treating the same clinical situation. So why, why are the differences? So in my opinion, we learn from different mentors and teachers that have different treatment philosophies and we typically stay in the same philosophy. We typically keep keep doing the same thing, that's one option. And we also differ in our knowledge, in our experience and expertise. So if we know to do more, we have more knowledge and we have more training and coaching, we can do more, we can offer the patients more options and the doctors that are more knowledgeable have more treatment options and, and perhaps better than others. But all of us go through a certain learning curve where we are trying different types of treatments, we modify our techniques, we're getting better with time, and eventually we stick to what works in our own hands. So it so happens that when different doctors treat the same situation, they all learn, they all improve, but eventually they keep performing a certain procedure that works and that may be different. Now, we can reach the same result using several ways. So there are many ways to get to Rome and nothing wrong with that. We can certainly achieve good results and same results using different methods. Now the issue of grafting infected sites is an old debate and I looked back at, at my own presentations and I looked at a lecture that I gave at the Academy of General Dentistry several years ago where I described the case of a severely infected central incisor and I, and I showed the management. And back then the title was just the same. It was the same question, can and should we graft infected sites? So the case that I was presenting was a patient with aggressive periodontal disease with severe bone loss and um, mobility and I extracted the tooth. And when the tooth was extracted, there was a complete loss of the buccal place. Quite severe, it doesn't get worse than that. And what I showed is a similar technique where I handled the missing buccal plate with a membrane and a bone graft. And I even used the um, template technique and collagen plug, very simple. And I think my techniques improved with time and, and uh, you know, as I went through my own learning curve. But the result that I got was great. I actually got too much bone. And, and I definitely demonstrated with this case that even in a very severe severely infected uh, extraction socket, you can still obtain a good result. Actually, it was that good that I had to cut the bone back at the time of implant placement. So it's definitely feasible. Now, we know that regardless of the infection, bone grafting will work if you remove the source of the infection. That's the most important 
apart, and that's uh, typically the tooth, the cracked tooth or the infected tooth. And we also remove the granuloma and all the other byproducts and, and irrigate the uh, site very well. Now, this is the most important part of the procedure, cleaning out the source of the infection, making sure there's good blood supply for your bone graft, and this one has to be well-contained and also stable. So if you follow these rules, your bone grafts will be successful, regardless of the level of infection. It's kind of a, a general rule. Now, the question is, what is the best way to graft? What is the best way to handle the extraction socket? Now, here you have options, and, and I learned from the debate online about different options, different than mine, and it really depends on the specifics of the case. Uh, if you decide to, you can definitely plan on more combination procedures and more immediate grafting, immediate implantation and, and uh, possibly provisionalization. And it's also okay to delay procedures and maybe stage them as well, more in a conservative way. Now, my approach is somewhere in the middle. It really depends on your risk tolerance. If you combine procedure, if you do things more immediate, there is certainly, and, and even proven, there, there's a, an increased element of risk. If you delay things more, it's a little bit safer, but there are advantages and disadvantages for both. So don't feel bad if you're in one end of the spectrum. As long as you're getting good results and your treatments are working, you're happy with the results, keep doing what you're doing and just, uh, you know, stay with the same recipe because it obviously works for you. But we are all different. We're all different. We have all different um, levels of experience and different risk tolerance. So I wanted to show you one more case where, where the buckle plate was missing and how I handle it. And uh, I hope this case will help you answer some of the questions that you may have. So this patient presented with tooth number 30 with a large buccal abscess with a large swelling and actually a fistula and a drainage. And this tooth had an endoperio lesion that uh, was going on for some time. Patient didn't want to do anything about it. And eventually it got to, to a situation where the tooth became mobile and lost significant amount of bone. We decided to extract it, graft and place an em an implant later on. So the first step was to extract the tooth was relatively uh, simple, uncomplicated, uncomplicated. The tooth was already uh, mobile. And after that, I reflected the full thickness buccal flap. And you can see that this is a very large infection. There's a, almost a complete loss of the buccal plate. And you can see the, uh, the area of the um, distal root. It's almost where the root tip was very severe. So the first step is to debride the area, remove all the infection, make sure that you're in contact with healthy bone and the bone is bleeding and vascular. That really helps. So what we'll do then, we'll take some bone graft and mix it with platelet-rich fibrin, and that will enhance the bone grafting potential for increased uh, you know, bone uh, vascularization and uh, bone induction and really uh, makes the healing much better in my experience. So we mix this PRF together with the, with the bone graft, and that will be placed inside the socket. Now, the, f the other thing that we need to do is also think about the buccal plate. So in this case, I use two types of membrane. One membrane is the platelet-rich fibrin membrane, which is a soft tissue membrane made of, out of the patient's own blood product. And I'm going to use a PRF plug to place on top of the bone graft on the occlusal surface of the extraction so socket. And I'm also going to use a collagen membrane for rigidity. The PRF uh, membrane is just not rigid enough. It doesn't have a good structural stability. So I'm going to prepare a collagen membrane also using the template technique I showed you before. And I'm going to place the membrane in two layers. The layer closer to, to the extraction socket will be made out of collagen and the layer outside will be made out of PRF because I was thinking about the uh, fistula and the perforation in the flap. And you can certainly use uh, two PRF membranes on each side. That's really up to you. So following that, I'll place some bone graft inside the socket and uh, the collagen plug on the occlusal surface and use some X sutures to keep everything stable. So that's, that's how I manage this, this uh, particular case with the missing buckle plate. Now, I would wait at least three to four months 
for complete healing. There was a large infection, significant bone loss. Give it a good time to heal. Don't rush and go in with the implant. But about four months later, the site healed very well. There were no, no significant side effect effects. And, and you can tell that the implant site is deficient to some extent. And you can definitely expect it for most, most extraction areas for uh, definitely when you have a large infection. But what we need to do next is get a CT scan and see how much bone we have and see how we manage the implantation process. So what I did, I, I had patient the patient referred for a CT scan. I also took some study models and I inc incorporated all this information inside, inside a computer-guided software. This In this uh, case, I'm using uh, Simplant Planner. And this software allows me to create a virtual wax up, a virtual tooth, uh, in basically on top of the uh, model that is now virtual. And I'm going to do my simulation based on the data that I have. So I can definitely uh, mark the inferior alveolar nerve. I can see the adjacent teeth and the roots position. And I'll start planning my implant position in the right trajectory to give me, give me screw access. So I know that the site is uh, deficient. I think it's still adequate, uh, but it's, you know, it's definitely not ideal. So I wanted to show you how this was managed. So I placed the implant in a position that I feel is proper in terms of the relationship with the adjacent teeth, the nerve, and also restoratively uh, to give me uh, screw access. And I can also observe the bone prior to the implant surgery. And I notice a couple of bo bone voids and that prepares me for the procedure. I know that I may need to do some additional grafting at the time of implant placement. So what I do next, I order a surgical guide. Here we see the virtual guide at the moment, and that's what we're going to order. I'm pointing to the buccal flange. I'm definitely planning to reflect the flap. I'm not going to do it as a flapless procedure, and I can already prepare for removing some of this flange in, in, in case it is um, interfering with my, my surgery. So the day off, we're placing the surgical guide and we're looking at the occlusal surface and I wanted to show you what is the flap management. So I'm, I'm going to use a technique called the half punch technique. We're not going to do a full punch because I'm trying to preserve as much tissue. So I'm going to start with a mid-crestal incision and then an intrasulcular incision only on the buccal aspect of the adjacent teeth. Now I'm also going to punch or half punch the lingual tissue. And how, how, how is that going to work? That's, that's a, a good question. So what we'll do first, we'll make the mid-crestal incision, reflect the full thickness flap, and then place our surgical guide. You can see that the flap is lying against the, the, um, the, uh, the guide. So when I place my punch drill through the guide, it's going to punch out only the lingual tissue, and that's what I want. So I'll, I'll create the half punch, remove, remove the excess tissue, now I have access to the ridge. And now when I reflect the flap, you can see the extent of the ridge. It's uh, somewhat deficient, no doubt about it, but it's still adequate. We can also see a little void right on the buckle. That's what we detected on the scan as well. So I know that I'll have to add some mineral, some bone graft at the time of placement. So what I'll do, I'll start with the initial osteotomy uh, using my surgical guide. I'll place a direction indicator and ideally take a periapical radiograph. That's a verification to make sure that your plan was proper, at least in the mesodistal direction. And if you see that everything is fine, you can continue with the drilling protocol using your keys and using the uh, proper drills that are in your sequence that you, you pre-planned and, and you have. And nothing wrong with taking a few more periapicals during to make sure that you have still the right trajectory. And you can, again, take a periapical to make sure that you're in the right path. And once you completed your osteotomy, you can place your implant uh, fully guided, meaning we will connect the fixture mount to the implant and place it through the guide. So that will ensure that not only are we creating an osteotomy that is uh, based on the plan um, in, in our virtual software, but also the placement is fully guided, and that, that really helps make things much more accurate. Now, you can um, you know, not reach the full uh, position first and then place a torque driver uh, just to give it a couple more twists and turns, 
In this case, I achieved really good uh, implant stability and the torque values were over 40 Newton centimeters, so definitely stable. So that really proved to me that even in, a, in an infected site, in a severely infected site with uh, a missing buckle plate and the, the worst possible scenario, we can still get good bone volume, adequate bone volume and good bone quality. So what I do next, I remove the fixture mount and this is the final implant position. I may have, I may, probably should have uh, turned it a little bit more to the buckle and uh, more for alignment. And the next step, I will place some bone graft, some particles in, in the void right in here. And because the bone quality was great, I'll place a healing abutment and suture around it. And this is the final position of the implant. So this is the completion of the case and how I handled it. So I showed you one way to missing the buckle plate. I used uh, naturally a bone graft. I used a rigid membrane made out of collagen. I used some biologics with a PRF plug and a PRF membrane and the uh, actual PRF fluid. And I believe that um, when, when you follow the rules and you follow the bi biologic principles, you can get a good result. Now, this is not to say that this was an ideal implant site. It certainly is deficient from a bone and soft tissue perspective, but I believe this was very, uh, you know, very reasonable result, very good result uh, that I know is going to work. And the um, torque values for the implant are really a, a good testament for that. So this is another option to manage the missing buckle plate. Now, if you look at the cross section, what's interesting to see is that the buckle plate will start regenerating, maybe not in the same volume it was before, but it'll start creating a cortex, not as thick as the original one, but just give it some time. And I gave this case, I think between three and four months before I went in and placed, placed the implant. So back to the question, can you graft an infected site? The answer is, in my opinion, yes. And there are certain advantages to it when you do it at the time of extraction. Uh, first of all, it's a surgical opportunity. The patient is anesthetized. We are already um, extracting a tooth we have a surgical opportunity uh, to graft the site. The tissue is also distended and stretched out because of the in infection and, the, and the, the large swelling, and that allows you to place a lot of bone graft, you know, with, without need, need to, to stretch and pull the tissue too much, uh, there's room. Uh, the other factor is that the site is ready for healing. There's a very significant inflammatory uh, response in the area. Uh, all the good cells are ready for healing and ready to, to regenerate the bone. So I think it's a great opportunity to do. And, and also, I think there's no downside because for the worst, worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, you can always go back and, and graft again. I think it's an opportunity. If you're not doing any type of grafting at the time of placement, I think you're missing an opportunity. But that is, that is my opinion. So you have to also make sure that for this to work, you need to have a good uh, blood supply. You need to make sure that the source of the infection is completely removed. You have to ensure that and that your graft is contained and stable. If you follow the rules, uh, certainly you get a very good result. So basically this uh, completes this case presentation. I hope uh, this was very helpful to you. I hope it um, answered some of your que questions and maybe created some more questions. And please feel free to engage with me and email me and give me some comments. Uh, certainly visit surgicalmaster.com for um, more videos and also to sign up for my weekly blog and, and video. And I look forward to meeting with you and working with you in the future.